Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2019 Mitsui Distinguished Lecture. My name is Jim Krakonis. Uh, I'm serving this year as the Interim Academic Vice President. I uh, bring you certainly my own welcome, but also that uh, of our President, Michael Johnson, who happens to be traveling on university business at this time. It just so happens that the uh, last few weeks of the spring semester at uh, John Carroll are a time of celebration, actually several celebrations. Last weekend we had a celebration of the uh, class of 2023 for admitted students, many of whom are going to be starting this coming fall. Next week we have a celebration of scholarship, of which the Mitsui Distinguished Lecture has often been a part. And it seems to me that uh, the Mitsui Distinguished Lecture itself is a kind of a celebration. It's a celebration of culture, society, the role of East Asia in the world, and the scholarship about those things. So uh, we're grateful for the scholarship that uh, brings us the most interesting topic tonight. And uh, I think uh, the topic of uh, this evening's talk is reflective of the richness of East Asian culture, its uh, accomplishment and standing in the world, and um, also uh, the uh, role that uh, scholars in this country, too, have played in uh, disseminating it. Whatever familiarity or acquaintance I have with the work of uh, Miyazaki is due to my colleague and friend, Roger Purdy, from the Department of History. That makes sense, given his own specialty in Japanese history, and also uh, the leadership that he brought for a number of years, a great many years, to East Asian studies. He's one of several dynamic former directors of East Asian studies who are with us this evening. And they include as well Susan Long, who uh, retired last year, and I am happy to say is uh, joining us with uh, her spouse, Bruce. So, welcome. And we also have, of course, the dynamic leadership provided by our current leader, Keiko Nakata, whom I'll mention again in just a moment. One of the strengths of the leadership of East Asian Studies is the special relationship that they've cultivated with the Mitsui Corporation. And it's a special pleasure to welcome again Georgine Waitala, who is here with her husband, Mark. Georgine is the general manager of the Cleveland Steel Products Department at Mitsui and Company USA. So we also celebrate your presence here tonight. Now it's my pleasure to turn things over to Keiko Nakano, who is uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Classical and Modern Languages and Literatures, and also the director of the East Asian Studies Program to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Dr. Kukonis. Uh, welcome to John Kelly University, and this is 2019 Distinguished Lecture. Uh, uh, thank you for music. And then uh, I'd like to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Susan Napier. And uh, so East Asian Studies uh, program of John Kelly University is very honored and fortunate to have Dr. Susan Napier as a speaker of 2019 Distinguished Mitsui Lecture. So Dr. Susan Napier is a gold weight professor of rhetoric and Japanese studies at Tufts University. Uh, Dr. Napier obtained BA, MA, and PH, PhD degrees from Harvard University. And she published her first book, Escape from the Westland, uh, Romanticism and Realism in the Fiction of Mishima Yukio and Oe Kenzaburo in 1991. Since then, Dr. Media published numerous books and articles. And her latest book, 
is Miyazaki's world, A Life in Art. It was published in 2018, last year, from Yale University. So the title of today's lecture is World Building, the Utopia Nightmare of Hayao Miyazaki. So please welcome Dr. Suzanne. Thank you, Keiko-san. That was a lovely introduction. Domo ni gozaimashita. And um, thank uh, Mitsubi Corporation very much for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, and I also want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, when I heard uh, that I would have a chance to go to Cleveland, I was actually very excited. I'd been here, I think, about 10, maybe more years ago, giving a talk at the um, Cleveland College of Art and Design. Is that it? And I had a great time. Uh, but it wasn't just for that reason that I was excited to come to Cleveland again. Um, this is going to sound very, very frivolous, but uh, I've always wanted uh, to be able to refer to a uh, specific, uh, very short episode in a movie called This is Spinal Tap. And I don't know if any of you have heard of it, um, but it, it involves Cleveland. And at one point, one of the characters in This is Spinal Tap says, hello, Cleveland. And so I want to say hello, Cleveland, to you all. Uh, and I, I have to tell you that <laughs> thank you that my daughter, when I when I told her this is what I wanted to do, she said, "Don't do it," because <laughs> no one is going to know uh, about this movie called This Is Spinal Tap. So could I have a show of hands of, of who has ever heard of This Is Spinal Tap? Oh, could be worse. <laughs> That's great. And and how many of you have seen This Is Spinal Tap? All right. Very good. OK, this brings me to my next question, uh, which is, um, how many of you tonight, before walking in here, have heard of Hayao Miyazaki? Not everyone. OK, interesting. But, but probably more than this is Spinal Tap. And um, how many of you have seen a Miyazaki movie? Again, more than this is Spinal Tap. So I think we are talking about a global moment here when an iconic uh, rock music parody documentary that was sort of a cult hit for many years is less well known in America uh, than Miyazaki Hayao's work. And as someone who, who very much uh, would like to um, uh, agree with the previous introduction about the richness of Japanese culture and East Asian culture, I have to say I'm, I'm really thrilled. Although I do recommend you go see this is Spinal Tap when you or stream it when you get a chance. Um, OK, I wanted to uh, talk today about um, Miyazaki Hayao and uh, the reasons why I ended up uh, writing a book on him. I have the book here. Um, and. Um, very briefly, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the genesis of the book. Uh, I had um, been interested in Hayao Miyazaki for some years uh, because about, now it's almost 20 years ago now, I published a book on Japanese anime. And in that book, even 20 years ago, it was very obvious I had a chapter on Miyazaki. And it was very obvious that Miyazaki was a very important uh, animation director. Uh, and uh, particularly what, what intrigued me was that even that point, and this was at least 20 years ago, it was clear that he was what we could call an auteur. An auteur is simply French for author, but it has a kind of wider meaning when we talk about a, a director, a cinema auteur, as someone who has a really distinctive, special uh, vision of, of the world and how he or she creates the movies that will then uh, express his or her world to you. So that struck me immediately about Miyazaki. Uh, and over the years, you know, I, I was thinking about, well, what do I want to write about next? Do I want to write another book on anime? No, maybe this time I'd like to write a book on a single anime director. And it was pretty obvious that the, the obvious choice was Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, so um, up until this point, I'd always either done literature or film. And I'd done it in a kind of very traditional way, which was uh, analysis. You know, you take a film or a text or a book and you write about it, you know, in terms of its, its various qualities, in terms of its framework, in terms of whatever sort of aspects you wish to talk about it, and then just, you know, finish that and go on to the next film or book. Um, so that's what I plan to do with Miyazaki. He has 11 feature films starting in uh, early 1980s, actually 79 was his very first one. Um, and going on until now, he is, even as we speak, hard at work on his 
next film. Uh, he also has, besides the 11 films, he has a television series that he created, and uh, again, this is early, uh, mid-1970s, and he also has a magnificent uh, manga, a graphic novel, um, a seven-volume, thousand-page manga that I'll, I'll refer very briefly to later on. So uh, there seemed like a lot of work for me to do, and uh, so I started work on it. I was pretty happy. And sort of, if you've ever been a scholar, a professor, as some of you have been, you'll know at a certain point you start thinking about publishers and who is going to publish this great work of yours. And uh, around the time I was about two-thirds of the way through, or at least I thought I was two-thirds of the way through the book, I was introduced to an editor at Yale. And um, this was very nice because Yale is a, is, a, is a good press and does very nice books. And so I was very excited. I thought, oh, would Yale be interested in my book? And apparently Yale was sort of changing directions. It was getting more into popular culture and sort of art books and kind of more visual uh, aspects of, of humanities. And so the, the editor said, yeah, we might be interested. And um, you know, send along your prospectus and you know, your table of contents, what you're planning to do. And so I sent it along and she called me up a couple of months later and said, yeah, we'd like to talk to you about this. I've talked to my board and they're interested. And I thought, well, yes, yes, this is so great. And so, uh, but she said, we have one question we wanted to ask you. And I thought, okay, fine, what is it? Uh, and she said, well, um, my board is wondering if you'd be interested in doing a biography of Miyazaki. And I thought, holy cow, I can't do this. Um, to do a biography is a whole different kind of set of skills which, and expertise, which I didn't have, and just so much more work, and I was tired, and I didn't want to do more work. Um, but, and also, working in Japanese, as, it, as I had done my research for the book, I had noticed interesting anecdotes, interviews, stories about Miyazaki from his uh, friends and colleagues. And I thought, oh, that, that sounds interesting. But it's a whole different kind of Japanese than I usually use. It's much in, in the interviews, often these be sort of talks with old friends and he'd have in jokes or you know, wouldn't finish his sentences or something and people would be, have to figure out what's going on. I thought, oh no, this is all too much, can't do it. Uh, so of course I said to her on the phone, a biography? Yes, I'd love to do a biography of Miyazaki. Yes. And so I then spent another two long years uh, reading all those interviews, finding all those anecdotes, um, looking up all those episodes of, of Miyazaki's life. And it turned out to be really interesting, uh, although a little scary, because again, because of um, just trying to deal with all the sort of colloquial language I was working on. But um, I did, occasionally I would have help and you know, be happy to talk about that later. But in the long run, the, um, the book was finished. and. Um, I think, on the whole, it's a more interesting book because I learned um, a lot about Miyazaki's life. And, I, and in certain ways, his life and also uh, the history of the time he grew up in, which was right in the middle of, of the Second World War and afterwards, that also helped, me, helped illuminate a lot of his movies. So what I'm going to talk about today is, is a lot about um, how his life uh, has illuminated his works, and also uh, what what special qualities his works have, which leads me to the question I already kind of asked, which is, um, what is the allure of Miyazaki's art? And uh, I think many of us here who know Miyazaki could have all different kinds of, of, of suggestions for that, but I think one thing that I'm particularly impressed by is that he creates worlds. He's a world builder. He's someone who, out of his head, literally out of his head, this is not a live action film director who's filming a bunch of people in, a, in an auditorium. This is someone who's drawing and creating a bunch of people in an auditorium, and he can do whatever he likes with them. Uh, and same with his worlds. He creates whatever worlds he wants, and he fills in the details and the specifics and makes them very immersive. You feel like you can just kind of walk right in and uh, really kind of participate in them. And they grow organically. And uh, these are some of his most famous, sort of uh, from some of his most famous movies. The top one is My Neighbor Totoro. Uh, the one on the right is um, Nashika, The Valley of Wind. Uh, this one down here is Spirited Away. That may be his most famous movie. It won the Academy Award for Best Animated Film in 2001. And uh, this last is from his, um, his most recent movie, uh, The Wind Rises. And I thought I'd, I'd play you a quick clip 
from uh, the movie on the right-hand side of Nashika. I hope you'll bear with me for a minute because uh, I have to move out of the present uh, mode. So, um, are any of you familiar with the Nashika? Sorry. Are any of you familiar with the Nashika movie? Few of you are. Um, well, it's set in the 30th century, and it is a science fiction movie. And Miyazaki has used a number of science fiction uh, tropes um, and stories in his work. Uh, and the clip I'm going to show you starts pretty early in the movie, uh, comes out pretty early in the movie. We've, been, we've gone through the credits, we've seen this kind of wasteland, uh, 30th century world that he is depicting again, very much from the ground up. Um, and then we see his protagonist uh, fly in on a little glider and take a gun and walk into this, this strange uh, alien wilderness. And in many ways, this is a classic, indeed a cliched, science fiction trope, uh, the intrepid human explorer going into the, the strange alien wilderness with a gun. Uh, but Miyazaki takes this in a very different direction. And this is, again, we see already, this is 1984, his very distinctive vision. Uh, first of all, the intrepid explorer is a girl. She's a young girl, and he was now Shika. She's about 16. Uh, and she is also not going in to shoot aliens. She's going in to look for uh, materials to help her people in the Valley of the Wind, which is where she's coming from, uh, help them build uh, sort of materials for their homes and, and to protect them. And uh, she looks at this alien world in a very different way than the conventional, um, kind of a typical strong, you know, astronaut type guy he, uh, who's kind of looking at and worrying about aliens and all that. She embraces this world. She is excited to be there. Uh, and so I'm going to give you this, um, this clip, and I hope you like it. And you see how beautifully detailed and realized uh, this, this place is. It's almost like a, a character in itself. It's called the Fukai, or the Sea of Decay, this tropical jungle, where all the insects, after a thousand years, have gotten very, very big. She is an explorer and a good um, swordswoman, and she also has um, a scientific laboratory uh, back home. She's collecting spores. Okay. Now the omu are the most, the biggest of these insects, and they pretty much dominate this new world. Oh, 
So this is the only time we see Nashka use a gun in the movie. Okay, so that was one example, and I wish I had time for many more of Miyazaki's world building, but I hope you see how he is able to create this, this really alien, otherworldly environment, uh, and then people it with a very real, relatable protagonist. And one of his special qualities is his ability to create very interesting, very believable characters. Often they're children, but sometimes they're uh, young, they're often young women, and sometimes they're even old women and old men, which is kind of exciting. He has a very wide uh, vision of the world. Um, and I want to mention him also in relation to other great world builders uh, who are not co coincidentally, I think, all in the people I've chosen, at least fantasy writers. Um, and I think Miyazaki does have a great deal of kinship with them. Uh, he again uses fantasy or science fiction to kind of create an alternative reality to our own, which, which does speak to our reality. And I imagine you all are familiar with Harry Potter, I, I hope. Um, and probably most of you are familiar with Lord of the Rings, I'm hoping, at least from the movies. And then perhaps less familiar, but the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis, uh, who creates an entire seven volume series about a, another world. Uh, and then uh, the Earthsea uh, Tales by Ursula Le Guin. And um, I don't know much about Le Guin's background, but I do know that these three uh, other writers, Lewis, uh, J.K. Rowling, and J.R. Tolkien, uh, are great really great world builders and they incorporate into their worlds some of their own trauma that they have dealt with in their childhoods or in their youth. Um, uh, Rowling had a rather problematic relationship with her father. We see this in the sometimes problematic father figures we see throughout the Harry Potter series and the, the search for a father figure. Uh, Tolkien um, was a, actually his father died when he was very young. He uh, grew up as a child in South Africa and then moved to England when still very little. He then served on the Western Front in uh, World War I and lost uh, three of his best friends in this terrible war. Um, it's not surprising that in his books we see a kind of cataclysmic, apocalyptic um, battle in which the ending is not exactly a purely happy one. Uh, C.S. Lewis, um, uh, his mother died when he was 10 and in, in, the, CS, in the Narnia books we see many, many times when the dead live again. Uh, and so we are seeing, in a way, uh, brilliant fantasy writers who create magical other worlds that actually are still incorporating some of their own very personal world as well. And I want now to talk a little bit about the building blocks that Miyazaki uses and incorporates into his uh, filmic world. And um, first one that I should mention is, this is not traumatic, this is the garden. Uh, he has a number of movies, almost every single Miyazaki film, although you may not notice it, may not be that big, noticeable, uh, contains a garden uh, in it. And it's very interesting. This is um, oops, from his last film, this, this particular um, picture, and that's The Wind Rises, and that's where in his very last film he puts his most typical Japanese garden. But the garden that he grew up in as a child uh, was in Utsunomiya, about 40 miles outside of Tokyo. His family had moved there to get uh, away from the 
air raids that were uh, increasingly happening over Tokyo in the last year of the war. And it was a beautiful big garden uh, with, with uh, carp and cicadas. And he, he had two older, uh, two brothers, two younger brothers at that point. And they run around the garden and have a great time. And I think there's a sort of sense of a, a lost paradise or of a secret, quiet place that you see in a number of his movies. Um, however, there is trauma even in the garden because um, in 1944, um, his own personal trauma comes out of a national trauma. Uh, the air raids come to Utsunomiya. And the air raids were uh, incredibly um, uh, intense. Uh, in one night alone in March of 1944, 1945, uh, 200,000 people were killed in Tokyo. Um, they had thought that Utsunomiya would be safe, but it wasn't. And so one of Miyazaki's earliest memories is of trying to escape the air raid. And um, air raids and just generally sort of air airplanes are very important features in his work. And by the way, he doesn't hate planes. He doesn't even hate technology per se. He's not a simplistic uh, creator, but he certainly does have a fascination with things up in the air. And sometimes, as in Howl's Moving Castle, he does show a, a literal example of an air raid. But in his case, he was seeing it through the eyes of a child. And uh, to quote a little bit um, from his uh, reminiscences, when I was four and a half, Utsunomiya was bombed. My uncle came along with a company truck, and they actually were quite rich. Uh, they had a company that made um, uh, conveyor belts for the Mitsubishi Zeros, which were a very uh, sophisticated kind of bomber. And my uncle came along with a company truck, smaller than the vehicles we have in the, these days. And he met, one that makes that point that it's really a little tiny vehicle, and they were all crammed in. We covered ourselves with a blanket. We had to somehow get through the place where the streets were burning. It's all around him, the streets are burning in his home. He wakes up at, in the middle of the night and he sees his, his entire room is, is bright pink. And it's not from dawn, it's not from sunrise, it's from the fires all around. And um, just then at the guardrail, a bunch of people arrived looking for shelter. My memory isn't totally clear on this, but I'm certain that I heard a woman's voice saying, please let us on. But the car just went on going. That's his uncle's car and his family in it. And the voice saying, please let us on, got farther away, and it gradually took root in my head, the way a traumatic event does. And he ceaselessly ruminates about this, this experience uh, and feels terribly guilty and thinks how it might have been different. Um, if I had been a parent and been told by my child to stop, I think I would have stopped. There are plenty of reasons why you couldn't do that, but I still think how much better it would have been if I had told them to stop or if my older brother had said it. And uh, to be honest, uh, Miyazaki's older brother remembers the situation a little bit differently, but they both agree that there was someone trying to get on who, who the family would not stop for. And Miyazaki then says, I guess it doesn't seem realistic that a four-year-old child would tell his parents to stop the car. But I felt that if such a child were to exist, this would have been a good time to tell them to stop. And I argue uh, in my, my, my work that Miyazaki is constantly trying to create that child that responsible child who really uh, wants to, um, to help people, who wants to be resilient, who wants to, to tell the grown-ups to stop whatever they're doing and, and help out and go a different way. So uh, I think by now you've seen that um, Miyazaki has a number of, of very uh, difficult moments in his, his life and his background. Uh, I think for many of, of, of us who initially come to Miyazaki thinking of him as, you know, this wonderful children-oriented family, uh, sprightly, beautiful fantasy filmmaker, and that's all true, uh, that sometimes it's a little bit surprising. The more I learned about it, the more I realized that there were dark aspects to his world, and that these, these dark aspects also come through in his movies, uh, sometimes in disguise or transformed form, but sometimes, uh, as in the, the bombing raids over in Howl's Moving Castle, quite explicitly. Um, but he also had one more personal trauma uh, that I think is, is very distinctive, which was that his mother uh, had tuberculosis for um, about nine or ten years of the time that Miyazaki was growing up. So the time he was about maybe five till the time he was 14. And um, this must have been really tough. This is a traditional Japanese uh, society in this, in this point. You, know, you usually have your mother taking care of you. In this case, if anything, uh, the boys would be taking care of her, uh, her sons, and uh, Miyazaki had a very close bond with her, his mother. But um, 
tuberculosis was a terrible disease back then, and it was very, most likely uh, people died from it. In her case, in the mother's case, she did recover, uh, which was wonderful, and lived to be in her 60s. Uh, but clearly this, this sense of, of unease and worry uh, comes through in uh, some of his movies, uh, most uh, very obviously in Totoro, uh, which is a movie about uh, two young girls who move to the country because their mother is sick. She's in a hospital in the, in the country and they want to be close to her. And um, we're never told it's tuberculosis in the movie, but in the book that's published about the movie, we learned it is tuberculosis. And one of the sort of major crisis points in the movie is when the mother is supposed to come home to visit and she doesn't and uh, she apparently is sick and they don't know why she's sick or, or how sick she is. Or, and they suddenly confront the possibility which they've been kind of not thinking about, which is that their mother might die. And it's a very, very painful moment. Uh, and in fact, it's okay, she doesn't die. Um, but we have, for a children's movie, a pretty dark scene. Um, we, much even more obviously is in The Wind Rises, his last and most recent movie, in which the heroine, Naoko, uh, is a lovely young woman, she's a painter, she's a delightful young person, uh, and she develops tuberculosis and um, literally spits up blood and dies uh, in the movie. Um, and finally, this is more of a transformation, but I mentioned that Miyazaki had a manga, a um, graphic novel named Naushika, which is based on the movie that I just showed you um, a clip from. And in that movie, there's a very interesting scene, I won't go into uh, that manga, a very interesting scene, um, towards the end of the manga, uh, it's an epic manga and Naushika is trying to kind of deal with the world and deal with a terrible uh, threat to the world or her world. And she's kind of having a, we call it a grand inquisitor scene when she's dealing with a, an, another authority figure who's saying, I know better, I know better, you've got to stop this young lady. And, uh, she, and he says, you know, you've got to kind of think of a different, different way of existing. And he says, no, I'm going to keep on existing and my people are going to go on existing the way you always have. We are birds who, even though we spit blood, still go flying into the air. And I thought, it really took me a while to notice that, that spitting blood thing, because I always thought, that's kind of weird. And I thought, oh, he's again, he's going back to his mother and the resilience and the need to keep on going, the pers to persevere against uh, sort of terrible things. So by now, I, I hope I've not totally ruined your uh, feeling about Miyazaki. Um, but I bring this up because I thought it might be interesting to, um, to discuss a little bit uh, a rather unusual review uh, of my book uh, that I just uh, found about a month ago. I was contacted by the people. It's, um, it's in a, uh, uh, some kind of a journal called First Things. and. Um, I guess the editor for literature in the journal actually contacted me and said, well, we're running a review. Um, you might want to respond to it. I thought, oh, God. You know, that's usually not a good sign. Um, so I read it, and it actually was kind of interesting. Um, the person at least was thinking and, um, you know, uh, responding sort of to some of the ideas I brought up, which is, which is great. Um, and he actually says one nice thing. Uh, which is that Napier helps us see how Miyazaki inspires in children a desire to know and love the world as it really is. And in a funny way, he does. I mean, his work is often fantastic or science fiction, but it is, say, rooted in this very real world aspect to it. Uh, now, I contend that it's, uh, it's precisely because he deals with real world difficulties, like your mother being sick or an air raid, uh, but he does it through the fantastic, through the, through the magical, uh, that it actually makes it easier for us to deal with this. Because it is scary. The world is a scary place. And if we deal with it totally realistically, that can get very overwhelming. But if you can do it at arm's length, through animation, through fantasy, through uh, alternate science fiction world, I think it actually helps uh, us um, contend with uh, the trauma of reality. Uh, but this man did not agree. Among other things, he um, did not like uh, my assessment of Miyazaki because he thought my political uh, preoccupations were um, uh, unfair, that I was, I was sort of putting them onto Miyazaki, which is kind of ironic because I think he sees me, you know, I come from Boston as this wild-eyed radical. And actually one of the things I love about Miyazaki is in many ways he's very conservative. He believes in tradition. He believes in respect. I mean, he's, he's really, um, yes, he has, he's, he has many different sides to him, and that's again what I love about him. He's a complicated man. Um, but uh, she, uh, the, this reviewer, did not like the fact that I 
in his opinion, didn't extol the formal merits of the films, but I celebrate them for their purportedly enlightened politics. And one is an echo fable, and that would probably be, I think he means Princess Mia Mononoke, which is one of his greatest works, and it's a, it is an environmentalist work. Although Miyazaki himself does not want to be known as Mr. Environment, he, he can see the kind of excesses in that uh, sort of idea as well. Um, and another case, I said that uh, his work generally makes social and political critiques. And I'm sorry, that should have a quotation mark there. And this really did kind of stop me. I thought, wait a minute. Um, is there a problem with a movie making social and political critiques? And I think many works of, of fiction, art, uh, film do make social and polit political critiques. So I was a little bit, um, huh. And I thought, why is he thinking this? And I don't know for sure, but I'm wondering if it is because he sees Miyazaki as a family oriented director who um, creates delightful fantasies. And uh, you know, it's also animated, which is cute and fun, and maybe a little bit, you know, humorous and for children. And so this this simply was not acceptable. Well, I'm going to um, spend the next uh, bit of this uh, talk kind of showing you uh, some of the ways in which I think he does make all kinds of of um, the kind of things that Miyazaki does bring to his movies, which include beauty and love and um, hope and resilience. But, but often uh, he shows these through working through very difficult uh, things about the world, which can include, in some ways, a critique of the world we live in. So, um, yes, that's right. Oh, he also didn't like my use of the fantastic. Uh, with Miyazaki, she, that be me, Napier, says that fantastic becomes not only a means of liberation and empowerment, but also a form of utopian critique. And I do believe that when we see other worlds that are beautiful, that are peaceful, like Nausicaa comes from this valley of the wind, which is very utopian. Uh, it's powered by wind. It's very bucolic. Um, it's, um, you know, the, all the generations live together very happily. Um, there's a great deal of love that, in a way, it is, he is trying to say, yes, wouldn't it be nice to have another world like that? Uh, to me, that is a, a critique of the world that is, again, not particularly radical or subversive, but just giving us a, a different way of looking at the world. So um, I think that what Miyazaki is really fighting is what Max Weber said in 1909, which is that the, where our times are, are characterized above all by the disenchantment of the world, that there is no magic left. All we have is technology and rationalization and a kind of uh, sort of uh, existential despair. And Miyazaki is saying, no, we, I, we can find enchantment and I'm going to show you it. So, Let's, let's look at what he's done over this time. Um, first of all, he uses animation to uh, show his alternative worlds to us. And uh, as Paul Wells, who's one of the great gurus of, of animation studies, says, to animate is to give life and soul to a design, not through copying, but through the transformation of reality. And that's what Miyazaki is constantly doing. And as I, you saw in that Naushika clip, how in a way he's transforming a very typical trope of, you know, brave adventurers, explorer, take gun, go and kill uh, alien creatures, and, and completely changes that uh, into a very, very transformative vision of reality. So, um, and he does this all the time, uh, not just through fantasy, but also through the sheer beauty of his animation. Uh, this is very simple, uh, ordinary stuff that's going on in, in the top two, not the bottom two, I admit. Uh, the top two, you have a young girl who is making bentos for her family, and it's just, again, the way he uses light and shadow uh, and uh, creates this delicious looking food and the way she's, you know, she's really trying hard to do it just so. And you suddenly see this, the act of, of making food in a very, very uh, sublime way. Uh, this is another favorite scene of mine from Ponyo, a fairly recent film, in which a young girl who's half fish, half human, comes to live um, for a while with a human family. And um, she's, uh, she's kind of pretty magical herself. She can do all kinds of weird things like cause tsunami, but she's never seen ramen. And so they have this great scene where the, um, the mother of the family uh, brings out the dry ramen and um, puts it in a bowl. And um, then she says to Ponyo, the, the little fish girl, says, close your eyes. And for about two minutes, Ponyo has to not peek. And then you hear this kind of sizzling sound. And the mother has put a teapot and pulled hot water in and added a few things. And then she opens her eyes and look, there's ramen. 
And this is the kind of thing we probably don't think of as the most enchanting, most wonderful moment in our lives, but it's the kind of thing that Miyazaki says, yeah, there is enchantment, there is magic in everywhere. And then, of course, more obviously he does really sublime imagery. This is, again, of a kind of utopian world, La Puta, uh, which is um, a flying castle, and it's it's beautiful and green, and it's taken care of. The humans have all gone, but it's taken care of by a robot who's uh, very, um, very friendly and affectionate and cares more for the environment maybe than the humans did. Uh, and then, of course, this is this vision of total otherness, uh, the Shishigami in Princess Mononoke, the, the spirit god. And it just is, is kind of giving you a sense of, of just something that is really not of our world, but that is there, that exists. Maybe we don't just quite see it, but it's right on the boundary, right, right close to us, if only we looked up in the right, right moment on a moonlit night. So this is, again, very sort of simple ways in which he creates enchantment. He also uh, is a, a, a director who is both universal and very Japanese, or culturally specific. And you can see in the two um, images I have there, this is a castle in Europe from his 1979 movie, Castle Cagliostro, a classic uh, European fantasy castle, uh, and with you know, people dressed in very European clothes. Um, and then down below, we have a very Japanese uh, vision of a um, sacred tree, a camphor tree, kusunoki, and around it is, I hope you can see it, a, um, a rope, and that's a, uh, a Shinto, uh, which is a main Japanese indigenous form of animism, kind of, sort of like a religion, a uh, kind of sacred rope around the tree. So that would be very specific to Japan. And he has, he just casually kind of moves back and forth, or, around among these different kind of cultures. Um, another way he gives us universal forms is to um, his childhood itself. And this is from Spirited Away. And this, in many ways, is a classic childhood adventure. Uh, this young girl is separated from her parents who have been taken away by an evil, well, at least a naughty sorceress. And well, she's going to turn them into turn them into pigs and eat them. So I guess we could say she's evil, uh, somewhat evil. Um, but, uh, and the young girl has to save them, and we uh, should see that she is you know, trying to, uh, has, has a kind of quest and you know, show resilience. All of these things are very you know, transcultural that I think we'd all appreciate. But again, it's told in a very culturally specific Japanese manner because she, in order to save her parents, has to work in a bathhouse of the gods, uh, which is, there again, they're kind of from Shinto, uh, Sort of spirituality where you have gods that, that kind of are again sort of all around us and they come to the bathhouse because they're tired. Uh, there are certain Shinto beliefs, purity, because you have to clean the gods. She's actually helping uh, wash these very filthy uh, gods who've gotten polluted, or their rivers are polluted, or they've uh, gotten full of, of some kind of corrupt uh, substances. And so it's based also on, on kind of Japanese folklore and a sense of, of maybe the Japanese culture is sort of uh, perhaps needs cleaning in some way. So he goes, he, he incorporates both the universal and the specific in a way. Uh, and he does this in his fantasy. I'm just going to show a few of these lovely, lovely uh, just images. Um, one on the right is, is Ponyo, um, one above is Totoro, this strange fuzzy creature who is not any specific Japanese uh, folkloric creature, but just a fuzzy creature that Miyazaki invented from his own brain. Uh, this is Howl's Moving Castle, which is from an English children's uh, fantasy novel by an English writer, Diana Wayne Jones. And again, Spirited Away, we have the dragon, and dragons fly in China and Japan and all over East Asia, and they fly in the West too. So he's uh, doing a lot with all different kinds of fantasy. Uh, science fiction, again, you know, we have a robot, we have space travel, we have time, well, sort of futuristic time travel, and a kind of world, a vision of a kind of post-apocalyptic world at the top. Um, but now I want to get more into the uh, darker sides of Miyazaki, um, which include uh, visions of loss, trauma, and vanishing. And this is partly, again, I would suggest his own life, uh, his own childhood, the worry, the constant anxiety about his mother. Uh, also the fact that he grew up in a ruined world where the uh, country had been bombed uh, to total ruin, and he was literally rising out of the ashes of, of tremendous um, devastation. And um, also being a Japanese in the late 20th and 
early 21st century, if you're a Japanese that period, you're very aware that things are, are changing and traditions are vanishing and things that you loved and um, adored and venerated, such as nature uh, and um, the beauties of nature or the particular Japanese customs are vanishing too. Uh, so we have uh, this loss of a young girl, potential loss of a little girl in Totoro. Uh, we have this Laputa, this kind of utopian world that, that floats away at the end of, of the, the story. Uh, we have uh, Chihiro in um, Spirited Away who's literally vanishing in front of our eyes. She's uh, starting to um, kind of go see-through, as she says. Her body is, is, is going transparent. And then we see the after effects of a giant tsunami uh, in Ponyo. So these are our big heavy-duty things that Miyazaki is showing, again, in this very beautiful way. Uh, a lighter note, he does have some lovely romances. Um, most of his work is for children, but even with uh, some of his more child-oriented ones, he does have some, some very charming moments. Um, and uh, in his, perhaps his most unusual one, this is real fantasy, is um, the story of a former World War I aviator um, who is so upset by uh, World War I and the terrible things that happened that he's taken on the face of, of a pig. And um, that's Porco Rosso on the right. And he has a kind of quasi romance with this beautiful woman uh, whose name is Gina, who runs a hotel. And um, so that, that's very kind of almost uh, classic fantasy of um, a certain kind of sort of beauty and the beast, uh, but with again a sort of European uh, early 20th century, almost like a black and white movie like Casablanca sort of flair. Uh, and also, of course, nature. Um, many of you may have come to Miyazaki because he's such a great um, portraitist of nature and its many powers. Uh, there's a shooting star in Howl. There's a young artist who uh, really loves drawing crows and feels very comfortable with them. Again, there's Totoro, who's helping young girls create a garden. And then uh, there are the two young people who, after the tsunami, see a whole new side of nature as they see the sea has taken over uh, their village. A uh, very interesting aspect of Miyazaki is his willingness to talk about uh, both how scary and dangerous technology can be, but also how cool it is. And as I say, he's not simplistic. A lot of people come, I teach a seminar on Miyazaki, and they come and thinking, oh yeah, he's a, you know, he really hates technology, he believes we should just get rid of everything. Miyazaki is a realist, and he does like planes, and he does like cool stuff. Uh, and he understands that human beings also like it. It's very hard for us to, to, to kind of give this up. And he's saying, yeah, this is really tough. I'm going to show how difficult it is. I'm going to show how complicated it is. And so technology in his work is, is both alluring and fun and, and very cool, um, but also, of course, threatening as well. Uh, and this last, this last movie, The Wind Rises, is about the development of the Mitsubishi bomber, which, as I mentioned, uh, his family helped uh, to uh, create um, fan belts for. And they were the bombers that escorted the, um, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, but they're uh, incredible planes, and he shows how just extraordinary these planes were, and at the same time what destruction they wrought. And so he's, he's really trying to make us think, uh, not just kind of sit back and, and relax uh, in a kind of warm glow of escapism. Okay, uh, he also deals with family. Um, sometimes it's lovely family relationships, particularly in his early work. The two lower ones are Totoro and Kiki's delivery service. But as he gets into the 21st century, they're more, more complicated ones. Um, on the right-hand side are Chihiro's parents, who are kind of cold and materialistic, and they ignore her because they want to eat delicious food, and they get punished. Um, and then on the left, we have a, uh, the mother of this young boy uh, who's rather upset about things and drinks a huge can of beer and collapses on the bed. And uh, he's really the, the boy's one who kind of takes care of her. So even within these sort of family, um, very, and they're all still very nice people, basically, but he's showing conflict and complexity. Uh, ambition and its costs. I, I said, um, mentioned the word evil. Usually there's not a lot of evil characters in Miyazaki. It's one of the things I like about him, uh, that he doesn't, he usually shows uh, characters who are, who have many, uh, have, dark sides to them, but are also interesting 
people, I will say he does have one clearly evil person who's in a very early movie of his. But in general, these other people are ambitious, dreamers, and uh, that can lead to some very difficult problems. Um, he also goes into, very specifically, uh, political critiques. Um, the one on the left, top left is my favorite line uh, from Porco Rosso, the one about the World War I aviator with the face of a pig, in which the Italians are trying to get him back because he's such a good, good pilot, such a good flyer. And he, he tells him, um, I'd rather be a pig than a fascist. So that, that's fairly direct. Um, and he also deals with money and poverty, uh, exile and displacement. A number of characters are sent away. Sent, sometimes they're happy to go away, like Kiki at top. She gets to uh, ride her broomstick into a nice new world. In other cases, in Princess Mononoke, a man is banished, a young man is banished from his village forever. Um, in the case of Spirited Away, a young girl, as I said, loses her parents and is often a strange bathhouse world. And in Howl's Moving Castle, a young girl is transformed into an old woman and is, is sort of forced to go out into the wasteland to take care of herself. So uh, these are potentially dark visions, although again, they are included in such enchanting and exquisite uh, processes that I think we, we can kind of deal with them more, more easily than we might in, again, a more directly realistic work. Uh, and then the last, uh, last big three, uh, the things that, that really will, will make um, uh, Miyazaki so well known um, and so beloved, uh, his constant uh, privileging or use of, of young women uh, from the age of five all the way to the age of, of in, in the woman houses and castles, the age of 80. Uh, this, we're much more used to empowered female characters in 2019, but when Miyazaki was starting out, this was not typical. And uh, something like Nausicaa in 1984, I mean, you think how long it took us to get The Hunger Games or Wonder Woman um, or Captain Marvel. I mean, these are all from much earlier ages, and it's a very impressive Miyazaki was able to do that. Um, and they are wonderful, likable, and very rich characters. And again, utopianism. He does show us worlds that are beautiful and are, are we might wish to, to live in them, which I do not think is such a bad thing uh, to show people. Um, and uh, he does also deal with the end of the world. Uh, he himself uh, was a child. Uh, not only was his, his city bombed, but uh, he also was um, four years old when two atomic bombs were dropped on Japan. Uh, Miyazaki and many other Japanese of his uh, generation are very aware of catastrophe. Uh, apocalypse, um, and he shows it in many of his movies. This is from Princess Mononoke, but we also saw the giant tsunami in Ponyo, um, and of course in The Wind Rises we see the aftermath of the war and the destruction. Uh, so again, quite a lot for a, a children's uh, movie director. So I wanted to finish up just with two quotations. First it's from Tom Moylan, and it's really talking about uh, sort of the fantastic and escapism because I think one, one sort of crit criticism that is sometimes leveled at, at Miyazaki or at science fiction or at fantasy in general is that it's escapist and we, it allows us not to think and we can you know, get away from the, you know, the horrors of the real world and kind of get all comfortable and not think about this. Um, but as Tom Moylan says, and he's talking about science fiction, uh, indeed the infamous escapism attributed to science fiction does not necessarily mean a debilitating escape from reality because it can also lead to an empowering escape to a very different way of thinking about and possibly being in the world. In other words, we can learn to engage with our own world by kind of going through fantasy and uh, alternative worlds. And finally, I want to end up with a quotation from Ursula Le Guin, um, uh, one of the most prominent female science fiction writers in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and she said, we who hobnob with hobbits and tell tall tales about the little green men are quite used to dismissal as mere entertainers or sternly disapproved of as escapists. But I think that the character categories are changing, like the times. Sophisticated readers are accepting the fact that an improbable and unimaginable world is going to produce an improbable and hypothetical art. At this point, realism is perhaps the least adequate means of understanding or portraying 
the incredible realities of our existence. And I think Miyazaki does do an amazing job at, at portraying, through his own special vision, the incredible realities of our existence. Thank you. Wow, that, that's really nice. Um, we actually at lunch today we were talking about yeah, how Miyazaki does um, have a lot of European influences as well because they're universal too. He creates universal things out of many different cultures and I really love that. But, but thank you and I, again I appreciate you understood the escaping from and escaping to. Um, I think there was a, yes? Can you talk a little bit more about his life itself? Uh, that's a fun question. Uh, as I said, I teach a seminar on Miyazaki. And a couple of years ago, one student rather endearingly suggested that she thought that Miyazaki must be just like Santa Claus. And I thought, well, he does have a white beard. Um, but uh, even Santa Claus probably isn't really like Santa Claus. Because if you have to manage a small but very intensive firm that creates very special things, every year or every two years and you have to be sort of part of everything and Miyazaki is a total workaholic I call him a projectaholic actually because he just he really is always wanting to you know get on to you know create something um, but he is a perfectionist he's always around um, I think he absolutely could drive some of his staff crazy and particularly in his the making of uh, Princess Mononoke that was a big, huge film. It was two hours and 10 minutes or something, and that's a lot of animation. And he personally drew something like 80,000 cells. I mean, it's incredible. Um, and he, um, he really, uh, he worked himself and he worked his staff really hard. And at the end he said, we were boro boro, which means crumbling. Uh, and some of his staff left. They just couldn't take it. And I met some of them, um, went out drinking with them. Uh, one night in Tokyo, and I think they're still shell-shocked from it. I mean, they're very proud to have worked with him. There's no question he's an, a genius. There's absolutely no question. But he is tough. He's very tough. And, but how can you be the head of a studio and at the same time create uh, pretty much, you know, he does, I, I joke he would see, thing, sing the theme song if he could, but he writes the theme songs, the lyrics and he chooses the voice actors, and he does, looks at the after recordings, and he does all the drawing and the storyboarding, and he writes the script. I mean, it doesn't really script, it's more of a storyboard that he makes up as he goes along. And of course, he's in charge of the animation. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. But yeah, I would say that it would be an honor to work with Miyazaki, but you know, good, good luck to you on you know, <laughs> living through it. And you had the young gentleman up there. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. And while I understand that Tales of the Earth was not directed by Miyazaki, it was produced by his company, right. the Studio Ghibli. So do you think that Woodwind has possibly influenced some of the work? Oh, absolutely. No, that's in fact, um, oh, darn it. Ah, yes, sorry. Um, I know there's a direct, there's very direct influence. Um, 
from the idea of <coughs> who? Hmm. Is on Princess Mononoke or something? I actually had a student who did a paper on this, and I'm, I'm really sorry, I'm blanking a little bit. Uh, but yes, I think they're definitely influenced, and he admires Le Guin very much. But as he said, the actual person who did the movie was his son, and that was not considered the, you know, the greatest adaptation ever. Yes? We were, uh, we were actually discussing, asking a question about Princess Mononoke and the male character that's involved there. And you were talking about a direct correlation from Le Guin. I'm just Ged, wondering, yeah. Ged and the curse that he carries, and the curse that is carried by the young man. Yes. And the yes. How they have to go and remove it. Exactly. To do it. Yeah, I'm sure that there is. I mean, one thing, again, we were talking about at lunch was this, you know, uh, how, how all great geniuses take um, are inspired by many, many other things. And Miyazaki is inspired by English children's literature. He's inspired by Le Guin. Um, he's inspired by um, The Little Prince. Um, you know, he, he takes things. He's inspired by um, uh, Japanese, um, great Japanese writers of modern realism. And he just kind of takes it all in and transforms it. But yeah, that, that's cool. I, I'm sure Princess Mononoke has, has definite uh, inspiration there. Yes? Uh, are there any other directors that you would tell us to look at for? Yeah, when I was trying to decide who I wanted to work on, and I mean, there are, yeah, I was going to, my, my second runner, my first runner would have been a man named Oshi, who does a um, movie called Ghost in the Shell. And he is, he also definitely has his own visions. And he's a very interesting guy. He actually went to seminary for a while and uses very explicit Christian um, uh, iconography and even quotes from uh, Corinthians at one point in Ghost in the Shell. But he hasn't been doing that much recently, whereas Miyazaki has just continued to create these very distinctive works. Uh, other people that you might have heard of is Mamoru Hosoda, who did Summer Wars. That's a, a kind of amalgamation of a Japanese traditional family countryside house with a gigantic uh, global video game. And it's, it's very cool. Um, I would also, definitely the other guy people are talking about now a lot is Makoto Shinkai, who did uh, Your Name, Kimi no Na, and that is the most popular anime film, you know, in history now. It's beaten out, spirited away, um, and my, Shinkai, they keep saying, is he the next Miyazaki? I don't think he is, because Miyazaki is Miyazaki, and Shinkai is Shinkai, but I think Shin, uh, Shinkai is one of the most beautiful image makers I've ever seen. To me, his, his works are a little bit less less imaginative, but he's definitely something to watch, and he's still quite young, as is, as is Hosoda of Summer War. So those would be the two I would, I would definitely have my eye on. Um, yes? I have a follow-up question. Uh, have you seen Mary and the Witch's Flower? And I understand that, again, it's not directed by me, yeah. but it's created by people who are from this firm. Uh, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Oh. Uh, um, I have seen Mary and the Witch of Flower. In fact, I was, I've been to the studio that it comes from twice. And Yone, Yone Bayashi, the man who directed it, is a lovely guy. And he actually directed one of my favorite uh, Ghibli films, not by Miyazaki, um, Secret World of Arietti, which is just an enchanting film. Um, and oh, I feel terrible talking about this in public. I, I, it's a, Mary and the Witch of Flower is nice. It's also based on, interesting, on an English children's fantasy story by a woman. Um, but I didn't find the animation as alluring. I hope that's OK to say that. Um, but that studio, oh, it's an interesting name of the studio. I can't remember, sorry. But they have a new movie out, which looks much, much to me more interesting. It's a, it's a set of three, uh, kind of, um, what do you call it? A, triplet movie or something. And it, it has, the animation looks more interesting and distinctive. And Yonabayashi did one of the, um, the movies and, and it was quite well reviewed. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes, and I, Studio Pono, I think it's called. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Do you think uh, in the world there are certain historical times that drive the populace to crave heroes and fantasies, yeah. and thinking back to uh, Norse mythology, oh, yeah. Greek mythology. Uh, and is he filling a void here that, or even Superman, and oh. is filling a void that is this particular historical time, right after World War II, that, mm -hmm. 
that was filling that void? What do you think? Uh, nice question. Um, actually, it's interesting. I've, I've done some work on Harry Potter, too. Uh, I think they're really quite amazing texts. And um, I used to do a, a lecture on Harry Potter in which I said, every generation gets the fantasy novel it deserves. And so I think it, it's, it's less World War II, but our generation that needs Miyazaki or that needs um, uh, Harry Potter or Game of Thrones, for example, which I didn't bring up because uh, I don't know enough about George Martin, the creator. But um, I think that the, what the, the popular fantasy works really do say a lot. And it's interesting that Lord of the Rings comes out after World War II, but that actually appears after World War II. And I think that that was a time of, of in Britain of sort of grayness and you know kind of building from the rubble and then and it has that kind of appeal then and then in the 60s all the flower children find it and it has a different me message to them so it's interesting Lord of the Rings is one that kind of went across a couple of generations and then it's this movie form uh, then created a whole new set of, of uh, audiences in, in a very different world late 20th century uh, at a time when I think we were kind of getting very um, disillusioned with technology. And that's when fantasy really roars back. You have Harry Potter, you have the Lord of the Rings movies, uh, you have Game of Thrones, and I think it's because we no longer believe in the, in the flying cars of, of the Jetsons and you know, all the cool stuff that technology was supposed to bring us and hasn't yet quite delivered. Yes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a really good question. Um, um, well, I think one thing, uh, Takahata is, um, was really the, uh, the co-founder of Studio Ghibli uh, with Miyazaki and a, and a very important director on his own. Although, interestingly enough, Takahata is not an animator, so he had the idea that he would direct, um, but he's somewhat kind of coming at things from a different way than, than Miyazaki is. Um, Takahata was probably Miyazaki's most important mentor. He's a few older, years older. He went to Tokyo University, which is you know the cool intellectual place to go to. He studied French literature, which is a cool thing for intellectuals to study. And, um, and I think Miyazaki, uh, really admired him for a long time and appreciated him. And a lot of Miyazaki's um, political views also came out of Takahata, who was, you know, fairly left-wing. Um, and Miyazaki was sort of more like, you know, I mean, he, even he, he cared about things a lot, but he didn't really have a framework, and Takahata gave that to him. Over the years, they did start to have differences. And Miyazaki, even by the 1980s, I think, or 90s, was, was describing Takahata as the descendant of a giant sloth. And by that, he meant that Takahata was not delivering his movies on time. And that was really tough. And one of the saddest things was um, the first uh, time that Totoro appeared, uh, its, its first premiere, was with another wonderful Takahata movie called Grave of Fireflies, which is a, uh, a work about um, the, uh, the aerial bombardment of Kobe, a city in Japan, and, and these two little children who are working, living through it. Uh, and this came out as a double bill, which is kind of amazing because here you have this, this moment of two of the greatest you know, Japanese animation films coming out at once. And the idea was that The Wind Rises was going to come out at the same time as Takahata's final film, um, The Tale of Princess Kaguya. And um, Takahata had been working on Kaguya for another two years more than Miyazaki had, and he still didn't get it finished. <laughs> And so that was really sad, um, and they came out at different times. But by the way, if you want to see a really marvelous film, I recommend this, this movie, The Tale of Princess Kaguya. It's one of the most beautiful animated movies or any movie I've ever seen. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. It's, it's made, based on a Japanese um, uh, 10th century tale about an old couple who find a, a little girl in, uh, the, in bamboo. And, um, uh, she and then they also get gold every time they, they cut the bamboo and they take her to court and she becomes this beautiful young woman and she has all these suitors but it's it's a very modern tale because she's she's someone who wants to live her own life and doesn't want to you know marry one of these suitors and and it ends up very differently from what you might expect and it's, it's just stunning so a little commercial there for Takahata yes 
Yeah, I met him three times, and the last time I met him was just about three years ago. We had about an hour and a half long interview. Um, he's a very, as you can imagine, very, I think the word would be ebullient. He's got a lot of energy and kind of, he's usually, when I first met him, he was, you know, very up and enthusiastic. And uh, the second time I met him, it was, he was getting an award and he was telling me all about his, his latest animation interests. Um, the last time an interview was about six months after he'd officially retired, because he did retire, and he was, he said, this time I'm really serious. And so at that point he was still in his seriously retired mode. And he was much more contemplative and quiet than I'd ever seen him before. And uh, one thing I did was, uh, my husband is a portrait painter, and I asked uh, Mr. Miyazaki, you know, how would you like to have your portrait painted if you were to have your, you know, have a portrait done? You know, would you like, uh, you know, special uh, icons? Would you like um, to have Totoro or something with you or something, you know, something special or, or just in green trees or something? And Miyazaki said, no, I'd just like to be, um, you know, drawn walking into the shadows. And I thought, ooh, <laughs> you know. Um, and he might, he might have a very different answer now. As I said, I think this was a very kind of low point in his life, uh, at least a quiet contemplative point. And he's since, as I said, he's starting it. He's creating a new film that should be out in another year. And there's going to be a Ghibli theme park, which I'm kind of have mixed feelings about. So yeah, Ghibli is definitely still, still around and still pulling its weight. Yes. Whoa, I don't, that's really, no one's ever asked me that. Um, the short answer and the obvious, simple answer is both. Um, yeah, I think he takes risks that if he were just worried about his audience, he wouldn't take. Um, I think Princess Mononoke was a risk. Uh, he really wanted to do something kind of set in the uh, medieval period, but a much more quiet kind of film about a, a man named Kamano Chome, who's a kind of a, a hermit who had kind of left the capital and went off and lived in the mountains. And, and I think they convinced him that wasn't going to be really a big best-selling animation movie, uh, so he did Princess Mononoke. Um, but, uh, and The Wind Rises was very controversial. Um, it's, you know, dealing with a, a death dealing technology, um, the development of, of these bomber planes. And that's not necessarily an appealing subject. And he was heavily criticized in Japan and outside Japan. Uh, he was criticized by Korea and China for, for kind of, did it seem like he was praising the zero and then uh, other, some of the more left wing people in Japan said, how is he, you know, he's, um, he's just he's becoming a fascist. He's just sort of saying, oh, isn't this beautiful? So uh, I think in the long run, he does things for himself. And sometimes he enjoys kind of throwing a gauntlet out to his audience. I think the wind rises was he was sort of saying, okay, you know, I'm gonna show you this difficult, problematic film and you're gonna, you're gonna have to think. So I think he kind of enjoys it. Yes. What made you like want to study behind like, the culture of Miyazaki? Um, the first Miyazaki movie I ever saw was also the second anime movie I ever saw, and it was Naoshika. And I realized when I was watching it that this was really different. Um, I loved science fiction as a kid, and, and um, I thought I enjoyed the sort of science fiction aspects of it, but I, I could tell he was doing something really different. And um, yeah, in a way, he, he goes into the sacred and the spiritual. I, mean, I didn't even really get into that, but that's something he's, he also deals with and very beautifully. And I thought, wow, you know, this, this is really an interesting filmmaker. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, one more question. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> that's, that's a little hard. Um, I think I, it's, it is really hard because at this point um, I have done, if, just for example for Miyazaki, I've just done so much work on Miyazaki. I feel like in some ways I really know him and that's very um, arrogant to say that. Um, but you know, I've, I've lived and breathed for eight years and what interests me is that um, Every time I see his work, I have something else new to say about it. Um, so it's kind of hard. Like uh, I was talking about Spirited Away the other day, and I thought, 
oh, darn, I didn't even think of that. It's so obvious. And so uh, I'll think of something that, that interests me. I mean, to be honest, I've written on food in a spirited way. I've written on, because um, food is really important in his work, I've written on um, his uh, idea of the vanishing Japan. And I mean, his, his uh, I mean, his use of, of Japanese folklore. I mean, I, I, I'll kind of find one thread and then I'll start, you know, pulling it apart and kind of saying, oh, yeah, this leads to this. And then and if you pull it all the way out, you have um, another a vision, my, my vision of the film. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if I'm always right, by the way, but that's also the pleasure. And, you know, I disagree. My, my students disagree with me in class, and that's great. I, I do wonder, the, the book's going to be translated to Japanese next year. And I do wonder if, if anyone at Studio Ghibli reads it, are they going to really hate it or not? Because they'll say, God, why is she, you know, she doesn't know anything about this. So we'll see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the uh, Dr. Nick is a uh, kind of eye-opening for me, and to see the uh, Miyazaki Hayao's uh, art, like uh, uh, anime, in different, uh, in many uh, ways. So I can see now the his works through many reasons, many aspects. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming.